Good morning, everyone. I'm Frank LaFerla, Dean of the UCI School of Biological Sciences, and it is my pleasure to welcome you, our alumni, students, parents, and friends, to our BioSci presentation titled, Even COVID Can't Stop Us From Saving the Environment. I'm sure you will all agree with me that the pandemic has demonstrated how critical biological research is to mankind. It's been a little bit more than a year since many folks first learned of coronaviruses. I learned about them in the late 1980s as a PhD student in microbiology at the University of Minnesota. And I recall many conversations with my colleagues about how fascinating these viruses were from a virology standpoint, but that was usually followed by the statement, they just don't seem to cause any interesting human diseases. How wrong was that? As I reflect back on my adult life, viruses like HIV, hepatitis, West Nile virus, Ebola, Zika, SARS, MERS, and other infectious agents like May cow disease have had a dreadful impact on our society. In 2020, COVID-19 quickly catapulted coronaviruses to the top of the planet's list of dire threats. But there are many other dangers now. Every day we are reminded of the need for research to address ongoing environmental disasters and the chronic depletion of our ecological systems and resources. Our school's foundational vision is mind, body, world, which emanated from a need to stress to our greater community the importance of basic life science in finding solutions. Support for and trust in our institutions is more important than ever as researchers seek to solve the multitude of challenges facing our planet and to educate and encourage future biologists. Today's panel is led by Professor Steve Allison of the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the Department of Earth System Science, and it also features four of his graduate students. Professor Allison was named the Climate Action Champion for UC Irvine in 2016, and today directs the Ridge to Reef Graduate Traineeship, a multidisciplinary program funded by the National Science Foundation to train the next generation of environmental problem solvers. I know you will enjoy this excellent panel, and please do keep in touch with our school, as well as continue to support the good work we do here to create a more brilliant future. So much, Dean LaFerla, and welcome everybody to our virtual homecoming program today. It's great to have you here. Uh, as Dean LaFerla said, my name is Steve Allison, and I've been studying the environment as a UCI professor for over 14 years now, and I'll be moderating today's panel. It's very uh, exciting to be here with you. Before we get started, I wanted to be sure to acknowledge the Quiche and Hashiman indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants and stewards of the land on which UCI is currently located, and who remain members of our really vibrant community here in Orange County to this very day. So as an environmental scientist, I study the beneficial impacts that microbes have, especially in soils. So microbes are tiny organisms like bacteria and fungi, and they live everywhere, including here in Southern California. I'm showing you here a picture of a sophisticated experiment we have to study the impact of drought on microbes and ecosystems living just here in the, the foothills outside of Irvine. My collaborators and I have discovered that these microbes are actually very resilient to climate change. If you go to the next slide, you can see a, a picture of us uh, out in the field, up in the mountains uh, surrounding uh, Southern California. And what we found is that these microbes like many organisms are actually very resilient and they may be able to handle climate change in ways that we never expected. This is really good news because microbes are important for promoting healthy soils for our agricultural systems, as well as healthy ecosystems in natural habitats. And I wanted to show this brief glimpse of my research because I wanted to emphasize how this work is going on throughout the time of the COVID pandemic. The problem is that even with COVID, our environmental problems are not going away. We still have to deal with issues like climate change, pollution, invasive species, uh, plastic trash, and most recently, as many of you know, who live around here, wildfire, which affected Irvine in uh, October of last year. 
So my work has been very rewarding, but I want to emphasize also that the graduate students on our campus are really the engines of innovation. They're the next generation, and they have really been dedicated uh, soldiering on through this pandemic, despite some really massive logistical, financial, emotional, personal hurdles that have affected all of us uh, throughout the pandemic. But their work is so important, and they really recognize this. They really know that their work is so important that it has to go on despite uh, these challenges from the pandemic. So today we're going to have a discussion with some of these amazing students from the Ridge to Reef program that I direct. And as the Dean mentioned, our program goal is to really train the next generation of environmental scientists, leaders, and problem solvers. And to do that, we're supporting not just scientific training, but also career training and professional development. So these students are equipped to go out into the workforce and tackle these problems. It's also important that we include students from many different backgrounds and disciplines and perspectives because these problems are complex and they require an interdisciplinary perspective. The students not only are studying, but they're also building partnerships, working with organizations who are solving these problems on the ground every day and translating that scientific knowledge to help these organizations come up with those solutions. So what I'd like to do now is just do a quick introduction of four of the students who will be joining us today. And then they're going to each introduce themselves. First of all, we have Ari Jong from Civil and Environmental Engineering. And she studies the resilience of our infrastructure to events like fires and floods. Next up, we'll have David Benuelas, who is a student in ecology and evolutionary biology. And he studies habitat restoration, both locally here in Orange County, but also up in the majestic redwoods of Northern California. After that, we have Phoebe Dawkins, also a student in ecology, and she works in our coastal oceans to study marine biology and kelp forest restoration. And finally, we'll have Ashley Green, who's a student in environmental engineering, tracking wastewater pollution, including most recently uh, COVID viruses in that wastewater. So now I'd like to ask each of our panelists to give a two minute overview of their research just really quickly. And then we'll have some panel discussion and Q&A with the audience. So Ari, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Thank you so much, Professor Allison and the School of BioSci for having me. Um, so this is a photo of me sampling urban stormwater during a rainstorm in LA. And uh, that I did that work before I came to UCI for grad school and learning about urban flooding is what got me interested in my current research topic, which is the impact of wildfires on flood risk in Southern California. Uh, so large wildfires in California, as you may know, are, are occurring more and more frequently. Out of the top 10 largest wildfires in state history, seven have happened in the last four years. And what you may not know is that after the fire is out, the danger is not necessarily over because rain over burn landscapes produces more erosion and runoff or flow of water over the land than rain over unburned landscapes. Next slide, please. And the reason for the, the reason for this is that wildfire removes vegetation from the hill slopes, which can uh, increase erosion because the vegetation is no longer there to stabilize the soil. Runoff increases because ash and char from the fire can clog the soil pores, and if the fire is hot enough, it can even make the soil repel water. So since less water is infiltrated into the ground. The runoff will pick up sediment as it flows out of a steep, the steep mountain canyon at high velocities, as you can see in this diagram. In Southern California, communities are typically protected from floods by debris basins at the foot of the mountains. These are structures that capture sediment and allow water to flow into flood control channels safely past our communities. But this infrastructure is only designed for a storm event and sediment load of a certain level based on historical storms and historical fires. So the increasing frequency of wildfires and barriers to cleaning out the debris basins, like a lack of funding, could cause these debris basins to overflow, sending a mixture of water and sediment into the flood control channel that can clog our flood channels and reduce their capacity, causing flooding. Next slide, please. So in this slide, you can see aerial photos of debris basins. On the left is uh, uh, before storms following a wildfire, and is on the right is after storms following a, uh, the Holy Fire in Riverside County. And you can see 
uh, the maintenance challenges faced by our flood control agency, agencies. So my research is focused on developing a model of post-fire fire flood risk that captures the relationship between natural factors like burn severity and rainfall intensity and human factors like infrastructure design and maintenance schedules. I aim to answer questions like, based on today's design standards for debris basins and channels, how do flood hazards change as a result of more frequent fires? And I'm currently working with Riverside County Flood Control District to produce useful information that will help them plan for future floods and continue to improve public safety here in Southern California. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ari. Next up, we have David. So would you like to tell us about your work? Hi, good morning, everyone. And first, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Allison and my PI, Kathleen Tree Cedar, who is making all of my research possible. And also my Bio 199 students, Neil Shaw and Jennifer uh, uh, Lopez, they're going to be graduating this uh, summer, so that's going to be a huge loss. But during COVID, I really got to studying uh, fungi in the ecosystem, and I truly believe uh, fungi are the future. And what's really important about mushrooms and fungi is not really what you see here, but really the relationship with the soil and the mycelium and the fungal hyphae, and that's sort of the roots of the mushroom that intertwine with some of the largest trees on earth. And pretty much every 80% of trees on earth have some kind of symbiotic relationship uh, with plants. And so my research is looking at how we can study microbes and fungi on a small scale using molecular methods uh, to help us uh, increase our chances of having successful restoration. And in the next image, you'll see you'll see uh, some of the forests I've worked in. And this is in the Redwoods National and State Parks. And this is an image of a second growth forest. And a second growth forest is one that had been previously logged. And redwoods actually can re-sprout from a stump. So they are the true giving tree. And 95% uh, of all redwoods from uh, Monterey County all the way to the Oregon border have been logged for uh, wood and other products. And only 5% are old growth, which is the original uh, redwoods and all of that lives in the Redwood National and State Park. So on the next image, you can see in a old growth forest how large the trees can get. And this is the Boy Scout tree and it's a really famous and tree in the Jedediah Smith Redwoods Park. And basically what I did for my research is look at the old growth and second growth forest. And I'm gonna be comparing the fungal partners of each forest and try to determine how we can bring in some of the fungi that might've been destroyed or lost during logging and how to put that into the second growth forest so that these trees can come back as big as these. And another thing that I do in important work locally, and the next image you'll see, is I also work with the Upper Newport Bay and work with the Newport Bay Conservancy. And I also work with, I also see some large mushrooms there. So I also do work um, up in the Redwoods, but also do uh, local work up here in the Upper Newport Bay. And this is some of the invasive fungi that actually is uh, antagonist to our native trees and is some of the ways we need to get rid of some of the fungi. So there's always good and bad fungi. And some of my research is how to use next generation sequencing and then tell us how to identify those. Thanks, David. It's been uh, great to see those uh, redwood trees up in, in Northern California got a chance to go up there last year. Thanks so much. Next up, we'll hear from Phoebe. Go ahead, Phoebe. Thank you, Professor Allison and BioSci for arranging this very exciting event. Um, and thank you to everyone today. In less than a decade, 90% of California's kelp forests have disappeared. Due to environmental stressors, such as increasing temperatures, kelps all around the world, and not only in California, are precipitously declining. Kelp forests are known to be one of the most productive ecosystems on our planet and provide many critical services to humans and to our environments. However, since the start of these major declines, there has been little to no natural recovery, calling on proactive restoration that can be implemented on a massive scale and also promote resilience against climate change in those restored populations. Next slide, please. Here at UCI, with professors Joe Lee Lamb and Matthew Bracken, we are working on the development of a novel technique known as green gravel to help restore these valuable ecosystems and future-proof them against proje projected increases in temperature. Next slide, please. The framework of green gravel is quite simple. Grow young kelp on small rocks, which you can see sitting at the bottom of the tanks here, and scatter those rocks out into the ocean to grow. 
Once the plants grow large enough, they fix themselves onto the underlying seafloor, slowly rebuilding the forest. Building off of this framework, we will also be trialing modern restoration techniques, such as exposing our kelps to different temperature stress regimes to see if we can prime them to be more temperature tolerant. Next slide, please. Stocked with hardy baby kelps, selected to withstand temperature stress, green gravel is an incredibly promising tool to restore and future-proof kelp forests in our warming oceans. Thank you. Thanks so much, Phoebe. Those are such valuable ecosystems we have off our coast here. Uh, next up in a similar theme is Ashley. Would you like to go ahead and tell us about your work? Yes, thank you, Professor Allison. As a first year PhD student in Dr. Sunny Zhang's lab in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, I've had the opportunity to collaborate on multiple research projects revolving around the sampling and detection of SARS-CoV-2 or the novel coronavirus in our water systems. The first project I participated in was a coastal environmental sampling project where myself and another lab member, who's also a Ridge Sharif graduate student, Alexis, were sampling at Newport Beach to see if the SARS-CoV-2 virus signal was traceable in ocean water due to upstream sewage discharges. Next slide, please. But with my interest in municipal water management, I switched focus and I'm currently collaborating on a project where we are conducting wastewater surveillance for SARS-CoV-2 at various wastewater facilities in Los Angeles County and locally in Irvine. In the picture on screen, you can see one of our research team members, Chow, sampling from a manhole that's actually on the UCI campus. Wastewater surveillance for the coronavirus is a useful tool that tracks changes in the community infections independent from clinical testing. But this work does not come without its challenges. The virus signal in wastewater comes from it being shed off of human feces and sewage systems. And this signal can often be weak and unreliable. In this project, we are looking at focusing on how to improve it's from wastewater facilities and our lab practices in-house to make sure that we have the highest chance of detecting the virus signal. Next slide. On screen is an image of some of the samples that we receive bi-weekly from various wastewater treatment plants in La LA County. Along with sampling from these plants too, we have also been sampling from septic tanks and manholes in Irvine so that we can understand how the SARS-CoV-2 virus concentrations are varying by location and where they are in the sewer shed. Ultimately, we want to understand how the virus concentration that we are detecting in this wastewater can be traced back to communities and represent community infections, which is not an easy feat because sewer and septic systems are complex environments for pathogen transport and persistence. This research is obviously really exciting because of the immediate need for more knowledge on COVID-19 infections in our communities, and I look forward to continuing to work more on this project. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Wow, you can really see how interesting and fascinating and important the work is that our, our students are doing. So thank you all for, <clears throat> for doing this work, first of all, and for sharing a little bit of that with us today. And what I'd like to do now is just ask a few follow-up questions and I'll, I'll put some of you on the spot, uh, but I think that there's good uh, questions for each of you to ad address uh, potentially individually here. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to ask you know, on this theme of solving environmental problems in the context of COVID, you know, how has it affected your research progress? And I wanted to ask uh, David in particular, because I know you were up uh, working in the, the Redwoods throughout last year during the pandemic. So what were some of the you know, issues or barriers you encountered and how did you deal with that and keep doing this really important work in the context of COVID? Thank you for that question. And I think it was a lot more paperwork and the, when you do your research, and actually the Redwood National and State Parks is the only park that's actually four different parks. So there's a state um, guidelines for COVID and there's also federal guidelines. So we had to like really follow both, but what was really helpful was our Dean in Ecology and Evolutionary uh, Biology actually had like a COVID safety plan and my PI also had one. So we had a lot of uh, tools to use to actually um, do the research permit and then actually get guidance from uh, my PI as well as the Dean um, for us to help us uh, come up with a plan to be safe and we're able to conduct the research with masks. And, you know, we had to take two vehicles sometimes to keep people uh, spread apart, but uh, I was able to do the research, but it was a little more difficult. Good. Thanks for uh, sharing that. Um, I'm gonna follow up with you, Ashley, and ask a little bit about 
your motivation? You know, how did you get involved with a, a research topic like wastewater? Like what was what was it that brought you to that that kind of topic? Yeah, I guess it's not the most glamorous topic uh, to be researching, but uh, in my undergrad, uh, I had a couple of internships with public water body authorities, and I worked for the Central Coast uh, Water Quality Control Board, as well as LA Sanitation, and seeing the important work and direct community impacts that you could have by working with municipal waters, um, because I'm also interested in uh, drinking water as well, it, it was really inspiring to me. And I do like the direct link between the engineering design work that I can do, as well as the environmental impacts that I can have within my work and the community impacts. Great, thanks. Does anybody else wanna share their sort of origin story of how they got involved in their, their research topic? Maybe uh, Ari, you wanna mention something about that? <laughs> yeah, sure. So when I was in high school, I saw the film An Inconvenient Truth, the documentary about climate change with Al Gore. And I knew that I wanted to address climate change somehow in my career. It took a while for me to settle on engineering because um, I love science, I loved movies, so I thought I would be an environmental documentary maker at first. Um, I went to school at Chapman University, just you know, a stone's throw away, and that was in environmental science and policy. I did uh, undergraduate research with some faculty members and realized that research was a great way to do science storytelling, which is kind of like, film uh, in that there's a lot of storytelling involved, but, um, you know, education, education is um, what I'm really interested in. And then I came to UCI because I uh, did some work at a LA nonprofit um, that does stormwater monitoring and uh, watershed management. And uh, my experience at that nonprofit made me realize that urban flooding is a huge issue in the Southern California region. And uh, that's how I ended up at UCI. Thanks. How about you, Phoebe? Um, so I originally um, was interested in doing research on diseases of corals and seagrasses. So that's what I sort of focused on in my master's thesis um, and recognized the impact that disease had on declining e ecosystems, um, important foundational ecosystems that support really important coastal biodiversity. So I was sort of inspired to um, shift into the restoration world. So when I started at UCI and saw this opportunity to work on declining kelps, which are declining um, at a scary rapid pace, over 90% in California, um, it just seemed like a perfect opportunity to start working in restoration and on kelps. Thanks. And how about you, David? Go ahead and tell us your origin story for how you got into fungi. I got into fungi because my master's um, PI, my master's supervisor, had mentioned uh, we had talked about this tree called the pepper tree, and she had said maybe there's some below ground effects, maybe something with fungi. And it turns out that the city of Newport Beach here near UCI was removing um, 10 acres of pepper trees because they're, uh, they affect the native habitat. So I pretty much I just called the city one day and said, hey, can I work on this project? I'm applying to UCI, and um, the rest is history. Great. <laughs> Excellent, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, partnerships, and you know, one of the key goals of this program is to build partnerships between researchers and practitioners or managers, out community members, uh, people who are on the ground addressing these problems and dealing with them. And I wonder uh, maybe if, if you could discuss that a little bit. You know, who are your partners in in this research? And maybe I'll start with with Ari there because it sounds like there's definitely some partners involved with our infrastructure. Yes, so uh, the work that I do in the flood lab at UCI, which is led by Professor Brett Sanders, is very applied in that we try to do research that pro produces useful information for practitioners like flood control agencies, um, resource managers, and even residents uh, who wanna know more about their flood risk, you know, coastal flood risk or urban flood risk downstream of fires. So uh, we teamed up with the Riverside County Flood Control um, District uh, to essentially hear what their needs are in terms of predicting sediment um, production after wildfires um, and then mapping the flood risk, potential flood risk after wildfires. So I've had a few meetings um, with the great folks over there and we 
hope to continue collaborating to create, you know, maps and also maybe some modeling tools for them that they could use operationally. Thanks. And how about you, Ashley? You're working with uh, the wastewater dischargers and others? Yeah. So for the specific project I'm working on now where we're looking at SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater streams, um, we're collaborating with Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts, and they have been more than helpful with helping provide us with the information and the access to their treatment facilities that we need uh, to be able to analyze these samples that we're collecting. And uh, recently in the last month, we started collaborating for this project with Irvine Ranch Water District as well. So it's really interesting to be able to um, work so close to home. And since we're sampling on campus at UC Irvine, we're able to uh, collaborate with on-campus people as well and make sure that uh, the information that we're gathering from the sewer systems here on campus uh, can be properly communicated to the campus community so that there isn't any worries. And I, I just want to note that within my lab, I feel really fortunate because my advisor, Dr. Sunny Zhang, really encourages a very interdisciplinary um, workforce and lab environment. And within my lab right now, I think I'm an environmental engineer, but I'm working with microbiologists, materials engineers. Um, we even have a biomedical um, student as well, an environmental health science student, all within our small little lab group. So I am always constantly learning and being able to get more knowledge from these people that I work with. So I feel fortunate. Thanks. Thanks for emphasizing that interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach. I think that's really valuable too. Yeah. Um, my last question for you all is about uh, the actions that people could take to help. So I'll, I'll start with, with you, Phoebe, and I know that your research group is interested in plastic trash and pollution and the impacts of that on our marine environments. So what, what can you know, average people do to help address some of these big environmental challenges that you're trying to address through research? That's a great um, question. And it's a very ambitious sort of effort that we all have to take in our daily lives to, to help reduce some of the risks that we, that we pose to, to marine ecosystems. Um, one of the main topics that my professor, my PI, Professor Jolie Lam has been working on is impacts of plastics on marine ecosystems such as corals um, and impacts such as increased disease prevalence and severity that contact with plastics um, bring upon these ecosystems. So this might seem sort of um, like a run of the mill sort of um, um, tip, but sort of reducing single use plastics in your everyday life um, is, is a really large um, contribution that, that we can all make. Excellent. Yeah, that's a key, key action. Everybody can do that, absolutely. Um, how about you, David? What can people do to save the redwoods or um, prevent invasive species from affecting our, our land ecosystems? I think uh, supporting nonprofits is a really key way because I feel nonprofits uh, work together with federal and state and the community and they bring everyone together. And for me, the Newport Bay Conservancy locally has really supported my research and they also provided me an internship while I was in the Ridge Tree program and also Save the Redwoods League. I also was fortunate to get a fellowship to support my research financially. And a lot of those nonprofits, um, you can donate to them every year and they'll send you a really cool calendar uh, or a paperless calendar, you know, if you want that type. But nonprofits are really key and just finding one that really supports your ideals and what you want to um, conserve. Great, thank you. How about you, Ari? What can people do to address floods and fires? Uh, it feels like a really big um, challenge that maybe feel out of your control, but I think a huge thing is, um, you know, increasing your own awareness about flood risk. Um, a lot of times we may not even know that we're in a floodplain, which is like the predicted area that may get submerged um, during a flood of a certain level. So you can go online, um, look up FEMA, and you can actually find your 100 year floodplain where you live. Um, and, you know, there's coastal flooding. So sometimes if you're closer to a beach, you're more at risk. And obviously, uh, not obviously, but you can imagine that. Uh, these risks are changing with climate change, um, with sea level rise and also um, extreme pre precipitation changes. So 
yeah, just kind of educate yourself about what your flood risk is and also um, heat evacuation warnings. And and, and the, the, the local flood control agencies are so good at putting this information out on social media and getting getting to people is just important for us to be aware of the risk and respond to those um, evacuations. Thank you. And finally, Ashley, what, what about a wastewater? What can people do to address coastal uh, pollutants and, and wastewater? Well, specifically for what I'm studying now, which is pathogens in our wastewaters and SARS-CoV-2, I think all of us know our, respons our social responsibility and our individual duties when it comes to stopping the spread of this pandemic. So mask up, socially distance, and even if you are vaccinated, still set an example for those around you and be socially responsible. Uh, but as for other wastewater pollutants, uh, just be conscious about where and how you are dumping your waste and look up how to properly dump your waste uh, because we don't want those contaminants in our ocean waters. Thanks, two important messages today for sure, thanks. So at this point, um, we have allowed some time for audience interaction and uh, hopefully you've been inspired and uh, had your thoughts provoked by this, this conversation. So we'd like to take some uh, questions from the audience for uh, the panelists. And so you can go ahead and put those in the uh, chat or discussion forum, uh, whatever button you have available. And I will go through and pose those questions. And in the meantime, while you're thinking of that, I don't know if maybe our panelists have questions for each other, as you've heard uh, the, the research topics that you're all exploring. So feel free to have some discussion on the panel while the audience poses their questions. The great things about the program is I think I've been able to learn more from other departments and other schools than I ever have. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be part of the program. Just, just for the experience, work with other students outside of my department. Okay, thank you. And we do uh, see some questions coming in now. Uh, question from Jessica Pratt, who's one of my colleagues in ecology, evolution, and biology. Ari, I'm curious about the social justice implications of your work. Is anyone looking at the distribution of flood impacts post-fire and socioeconomics or demographics of the most impacted areas? I know infrastructure quality often faces equity issues. Yeah, this is a really, really good question. So um, my PI, uh, Professor Brett Sanders, put in a NSF uh, proposal with, uh, our, the co-PI on that proposal is um, Professor Doug Houston, who is at the School of Social Ecology. and. Essentially, the proposal is to look at the socioeconomic distribution of um, communities downstream of the post-fire flooding. So um, there's something called the wildland urban interface, which is basically the transition zone between um, urban developed areas and, and mountain wildlands. And um, there are a lot of community generally, and this isn't always true, but um, some preliminary research shows that affluent communities are living up there in the mountains in that wild and urban interface. And then as you go downslope to the urban areas, it be like uh, the you get lower socioeconomic status. And so we would like to investigate that more by surveying um, people, learning about their level of flood risk awareness, and also you know looking at those, uh, the, the socioeconomic gradient. And the infrastructure, you're totally right. Uh, the quality of infrastructure varies as well. A lot of it is old and needs to be, you know, maintained and updated. So, well, hopefully we get funded for that proposal and we'll be looking into those exact questions. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Phoebe from uh, Daniel Call, who's one of our uh, fellow Rich to Reef students. How does kelp grown in a lab compare to natural kelp growth, especially in conditions that may not be suitable for healthy kelp ecosystems? Are there certain algal uh, species or foundation species that may be more adapted to California waters that are getting warmer? That's a really great, great question, Daniel. I'm gonna start with the second part of, of that question. Um, are there certain algae species that may be more adapted to California waters um, that are getting warmer? So. The, the extent of the specific algae species that we're working on, giant kelp or Macrocystis pyrifera, um, they dominate the southern 
sort of extent of California. And in the north, we have another species, Nereocystis um, or bull kelp, um, that is another dominant kelp in the north. So we are trying to identify more resilient populations throughout Southern California that we can use to um, restore more vulnerable populations in, this, in, in our southern extent that experience higher temperatures. Um, so we're trying to find populations within the species that we're interested in um, that, that are better adapted to, to face warming temperatures. Um, and there, there may be other algal species or foundation species that are better suited to face these increases in temperature, but um, giant kelp species and, and bull kelp species in the north are really um, unique kelp, uh, types of kelps that are canopy forming species. So they grow, um, they can grow up to two feet per day. They, they grow to be these really large sort of tree-like structures. Um, so although there might be better sort of understory or turf algaes that are better suited to face these stressors, um, we're really invested in sort of bolstering reviving um, these giant kelps in particular um, to these stressors. And as for your first question about how kelp grown in a lab differs from um, natural kelp growth, these canopy forming species are not suited <laughs> to be grown in the lab since they grow to be so huge and they grow so quickly. Um, so typically these kelps aren't grown past a month or two in the lab. Um, at which point they're they're put out into the wild. Thanks, thanks for uh, answering that that question. Really important in the context of our changing climate. Um, David, are you still uh, with us? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, we have a question for you. Uh, is there a field? Is there field work interested? Okay, I'm going to interpret the question a little different. Are there ways that uh, volunteers who are interested in, in field work can help uh, with redwood conservation uh, and other support for your, your kinds of efforts? Specifically to uh, this summer and uh, next uh, school year, we'll be recruiting more Bio 189 students through our, the internship program that the School of Biological Sciences have. And then uh, sometimes with our research, we have um, opportunities that are paid um, to do the field research. And that's usually um, through the, as an employee or a field technician. And then also you can contact the Save the Redwoods League and Newport Bay Conservancy. And they have a lot of volunteer opportunities for you to get involved wherever you live or whatever you wanna do remote volunteering or in person. Uh, but mostly the Bio 189 internship and then through our Kathleen Tree Cedar Lab website, post opportunities to join our lab. Yes, lots of opportunities for uh, community members and potential students to engage uh, with our with our programs here. So thanks for emphasizing that, David. Um, next up, another question for you, David. Uh, again, from Daniel, uh, what does a fungal transplant look like? As in bringing fungi from an original growth forest to a second or third growth forest? How do you, how do you move those fungi around? Yeah, I think it's it's not really about bringing a uh, certain fungi around, um, which we can do and uh, can work. You can make a thing called an inoculum. But I think what the most important thing is how we can influence what's there, and that's through prescribed fire. So the traditional people of the Yurok tribe, they would manage the coastal redwood forest um, with uh, prescribed fire and selective management and removing certain trees. And that would have uh, kept the fungi at a great level. But when you have too many trees from the second growth forest, and no burning and no thinning, then everything overgrows and that could create a more catastrophic fire. So it's really about influencing the fungi and getting rid of the unwanted trees and um, basically getting rid of the litter that accumulates if you don't do prescribed burning or you have um, fires that come through. Thank you. Um, while we wait for some more questions to come in, I was gonna ask uh, the students what you thought uh, was maybe the most important or valuable aspect of your interdisciplinary training at UCI so far? You know, how has that been helpful or or not? And, or what have the, the challenges been with that? So I don't know, feel free, anyone can take that, that question. 
I can chime in because uh, mm -hmm. the first thing that came to my mind was the communication aspect of our inter interdisciplinary training, uh, specifically from Bree McCorder, who I know is watching this presentation right <laughs> now. Uh, learning how to relay your research and the work that you find so important and know so much about to any type of audience is very valuable, especially within the broad environmental field. So really figuring out how to have sort of elevator pitches uh, to talk to different types of people was really beneficial to me. And one of the most interesting parts of any class that I've taken at UCI so far. And I feel fortunate that we will be able to build on these communication skills uh, throughout the rest of the Ridge to Reef program as well. Thanks. Yes, I appreciate that as the one who teaches the communication skills class along with uh, Bree McWhorter. Who I'll put in a, a plug for who's one of our UCI alumni and uh, in the MFA program. And uh, she has a firm that does professional speech coaching for uh, corporations, community groups, uh, as well as some of our faculty. And she also joins me for an annual class on communication skills, where we bring scholars from across disciplines together to hone their skills and actually be able to talk to each other across these different disciplines with all their jargon and specific uh, concepts. Anybody else want to add to Ashley's commentary? I'll just kind of add, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is very short that I really appreciate Bree and all of the energy she puts into uh, teaching this class. She made it really, or uh, teaching her part of the class. It was really fun. And I have always been interested in science communication, but I felt like I was able to take it to the next level and I feel more comfortable working with people in other fields now because of it. So thank you, Bree and Professor Allison. Of course. Did you want to mention something, Phoebe? I wanted to echo um, what Ashley had said and now Ari as well. Um, the, com the communication aspect of our interdisciplinary program has, has shed so much light on the sort of um, specialized concepts and, and niche jargon that we all sort of um, use to describe our research that's very common in academia and in writing these in papers and reports. So Bree and, and Steve, you as well, sort of reminding us to bring it down to earth and, and make our um, concepts accessible and our research accessible has been, um, and interesting and exciting to other people is, has been really helpful. Thanks. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that. David, did you want to say anything or we can move on? Yeah, I would say briefly too. I, you know, I agree. The science communication is definitely useful. And I also thought the team science course that I'm taking with Jennifer Long is really great because it shows you how to do a community agreement. So a lot of times I think we don't have enough organization with the community members, the government. So you kind of needed the agreement to, um, basically utilize everyone's talent for the end goal of whether it's restoration or social justice. So I really like the community agreements and how to like uh, manage working with it, working as a team. That's a great point. Yeah. So <clears throat> critical that we have tools at our disposal and training so that we can work together effectively, not just talk to each other, but actually understand expectations and um, have effective partnerships that you know, aren't exploiting one partner or the other and are maximizing, like you said, those benefits and talents of everybody involved. Thank you. Um, we have a couple other questions coming in uh, from John White. Is there any effort to rehabilitate fire ravaged land to help prevent the damage from future rains? That might be a question for Ari or, or David or, or others. Go ahead, Ari. Yeah, I'll just briefly say um, there is a certain amount of erosion control uh, that you know, flood control agency, agencies look into post burn. There are state, um, statewide uh, burn, basically they, it's an acronym called BEAR teams. I think burned area response um, teams, uh, emergency response teams who assess uh, ha the severity of the burn and they also help suggest um, treatments like uh, erosion control. Uh, but uh, a key part of it is, you know, uh, reducing the risk of large wildfires in the first place, which um, fi uh, fire management practices like prescribed burning can help with that. I'd say briefly too, the Reds, uh, the Redwoods, Coast Redwoods, uh, a large portion of the area got burned last year and same with the giant sequoias. 
and places like Big Basin State or Redwood Park uh, have raised a, a considerable amount of money to help rehab a lot of the area. A lot of the campgrounds were burned. So a lot of it, it comes down to funding. So supporting your local nonprofit, like the Severance Club or say the Redwoods League are really trying to uh, do some replanting and you know flood risk is a really big um, issue in the Big Basin State Park. So yeah, all those are good answers. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's really important given the unprecedented uh, wildfire scope and impacts that we had here in California in the past year. It's so really important that we have management strategies to deal with that and to try to build some resilience in these ecosystems. Um, next up, another uh, question from Dr. Jessica Pratt. I'm curious about the human health concerns of COVID in our watershed, our sewer shed. Are these live or viable viruses being detected? I know there has been some incidents of COVID infection in animals. Uh, is that a concern? So that's for you, Ashley, I think. Yeah, um, to my knowledge, there really isn't much human health concern from contracting COVID-19 in wastewater, and but there isn't much evidence there. And that's why people are really eagerly working on the research in this field to see if we can find any correlation between human infection from COVID-19 in our wastewater. Uh, but there is the issue that we do have to look at with if the COVID-19 is able to persist in this wastewater and live and ready to infect animals or humans, we need to be careful where, um, how we are treating the water and making sure that it's treated properly so that when it is used for reuse practices, let's say, um, we aren't irrigating our lab or our lands with um, water that could be potentially dangerous to humans or animals in our in our watershed. So yeah, it's a really interesting question. I it's a very complex question though because we really don't know right now, and we're trying to figure that out. Thanks, and uh, Dr. Pratt also thanks you for teaching the new word sewer shed. So speaking of our our jargon and uh, <laughs> special concepts, but that's a, a relevant one I think these days. Thank yeah, you. you have the watershed and you have the sewer shed. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so we're getting uh, sort of towards the end of the, the hour here. And just as a, as a final question, I wanted to ask you all, uh, you know, what what does the future look like? You know, are you hopeful? Are you optimistic um, as we go into the future, tackling these problems coming out of COVID, hopefully, but still dealing with these environmental problems? So uh, maybe Phoebe, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I'm incredibly optimistic. Um, scientific advances are providing never before imagined solutions to emerging environmental problems. We now have um, genetic editing tools like, like CRISPR-Cas9, so we can sort of go in there and, and directly edit um, the genes of populations to sort of help bolster them against against future stressors. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm incredibly optimistic. I think we have a lot of new tools at our disposal to be working with. How about you, David? I'm really optimistic and um, seeing all the redwoods with stumps that re-sprout gives me a lot of um, joy and happiness that things can re-come back from that kind of um, uh, you know, tragedy and also my bio 109 students give me a lot of hope. They're really excited and they were really sad to get out of the lab for so long. So they've been really wrapping up this quarter and I'm really inspired by my undergraduate students. Thank you. Ari? Yeah, I similarly am so inspired by the undergrad students that I TA and, and I work with and they, they have so much um, will to make a difference. They're very motivated to do that and they're enthusiastic and uh, I just think the youth are the future and climate change, yeah, it's a big problem, but there are a lot of motivated young people to work on it. And finally, you, Ashley? I could not agree more with what David, Ari, and Phoebe are all saying. I I'm optimistic as well. And I, I love mentoring and being able to serve as an inspiration and also learn from people who are younger than me, who are working twice, three times, 10 times as hard as me to really help solve these environmental problems. And uh, it, it's very inspiring. And that's why I, I want to teach someday too, so that I can continue to inspire and learn. Thank you. That's a great message. And yeah, you all give me hope. Uh, and I'll say that from my perspective as a instructor and advisor of graduate students, um, you really are the next generation and uh, just see how you've excelled and 
made it through this really difficult time. Uh, that's that's really a hopeful message. So I think that's a great place to end. Thank you all for your uh, sharing of your work today and all the great work that you're doing. Uh, take care and thanks to our audience for participating today. Bye now. Thank you.